I'm finding that I'm more drawn to the A1X than I was to the A1. And um, it just feels to me even more refined. Hi there, really great to see you. I hope I find you well. I'm Jenny Kirk. Welcome back to Weir Yard up here in the loft. And today we've got a review video of a new locomotive. And this is one that it's all wrapped up in the Hornby Centenary Year collection but it's actually one that was only announced comparatively recently. And yes, it's the Terrier that was done for the Collectors Club members. Now, I joined the Collectors Club pretty much for this locomotive, I have to be honest. And I am going to do a review, a comparison review, between the various different manufacturers Collectors Club at some point. But at the moment, I'm only a member of the Hornby one. And really, for me, the unique selling point was the Brighton Works Terrier. Now, we've done a review on some of the other terriers over um, months if not years since they first came out but this is one that really did catch my eye it was available under the uh, guise of the old model uh, but of course the old model it was past its prime so it's really great to see it reappear in the uh, full fat super detailed range really really happy to have this for my collection so without further ado and in association with the channel sponsor train o -Matic, makers of dcc decoders and accessories we're going to be taking a closer look and uh, stay tuned towards the end we're going to be doing a dcc fitting guide as well in association with train o -Matic and showing you how to get these little beauties dcc chipped but come with me I'm really excited to show you this <laughs> Here is the model and uh, really pleased to receive this. I've um, really taken a shine, I have to say, to the Terriers, both the A1 and the A1X. I've got examples from both Hornby and from Rails Depot, um, but this particular one has been offered as the club exclusive locomotive. And for me, very much, it was a, a great reason to join the club. And I'm guessing that a lot of other people as well. So a fine, fine choice from Hornby. It shows uh, the Terrier in what was actually a very late guys, uh, the London Brighton and South Coast ochre livery can be a bit deceptive, but it was a tradition for the Brighton Works shunter to be painted in this livery. And uh, this particular example, uh, I think it was Morden, was the actual locomotive's name when it was new. Uh, it was an A1X rather than an A1. And actually when I've looked through my Terrier collection, all of the other Hornbeat Terriers that I have are all A1, so it's also nice to be able to see the detail differences that make this an A1X model. It was a great criticism of the original Hornby model that it, it was kind of a hodgepodge of both. So it's nice that we can get both different versions from Hornby. It is DCC ready and stay tuned towards the end of the video. We're going to be showing you exactly how to fit this with a Trainomatic decoder. Uh, it is quite a tight fit and because the interior of these locomotives is exactly the same as Brighton, which was the locomotive that we reviewed before, uh, we will show you the footage from chipping that locomotive, but it's exactly the same across all of the Hornby Terriers. This is catalogue number R3849, BR LBSCR Terrier Brighton Works number 32635. So it did get a BR number, but a uh, club special there. And on the back of the box, we've got the generic Terrier history. But what I like about these is that the final paragraph gives you very specific information about the model in the box. And it's something which I've actually quite enjoyed reading about the histories of the specific locomotives. So we've got there about uh, Morden and uh, the numbers that it's carried. So it actually tells you that this is suitable from January 1959 uh, through to when it was withdrawn and then subsequently scrapped uh, on the 30th of March 1963. And it's one of those locomotives that I think uh, is the one that got away. A lot of people lament the fact that this wasn't saved because it was a well-photographed locomotive in this livery. 
Check it out the box, it's pretty standard uh, Hornby slipcase box and uh, uh, just put all that to one side. We do have uh, a detail bag, same as all the other Terriers that we've done to do with, um, I think it's um, vacuum pipes, air pipes, um, these locomotives uh, did have a Westinghouse air pump as well. It may even be steam heating, I'm not sure whether they were fitted for steam heating, but you can fit these if you want. What I would say is that uh, on the front buffer beam, there's some really nice unobtrusive holes for them to go in, so you don't end up with that thing where you have uh, very visible holes if you don't fit the detailing, but it does preclude you from using that front tension lock coupling if you do make use of those. So, um, because these were small shunting locomotives, for me, having that working coupling front and back is actually worth a lot more. So, I won't be fitting them myself, but uh, if it's your thing, then that is available in the box. Interestingly enough, once you get it out of the box, there are some noticeable detail differences between this and the other Terrier that we uh, recently reviewed in the LBSC livery from Hornby, but that was Brighton in its original A1 livery. So this locomotive, I've not taken it apart yet, so actually at the moment this is the full DC locomotive. It was one of my gripes with the um, review of the Brighton Terrier, was that these sandpipes were very prone to getting damaged in actually dismantling to DCC fit this locomotive. And interestingly enough, I think it's safe to say that um, the factory is probably having a few issues with these as well, because never having been dismantled, you can see there the actual black um, as showing through. This is very springy sort of steel, I think, but the red paint does not share the spring that the metal underneath has, so it just flakes straight off when these flex. Um, the front ones seem absolutely fine, um, but that is a small issue with the ones in these more ornate liveries. If you get one where they're just in the plain black, they're absolutely fine. But uh, we can also see, it's also a, a, an interesting point. I know with the Brighton Terrier, I did chip it before I did the main review. So I wasn't sure about the little gap you see across the bottom of the boiler. And actually you can see here on a locomotive that's not been dismantled for DCC chipping yet, it is still there, you can still see it. It's not massively prominent, but uh, I do feel obliged to point that out. Um, same on both sides, and that's just the way that these go together. The bottom uh, kind of, um, I guess the bottom sixth of the boiler is part of the chassis rather than the actual body itself. It's just the way it fits together. It's not too bad and um, does kind of line up with um, the um, the kind of the perch bracket that the uh, smoke box sits on. So it does draw the eye away from it, which is it's quite a clever little way of doing it. The rest of the model, in fact, I'm going to just pause here now and I'm going to get one of the A1 Terriers just to give you a much better comparison between the two, just so I can point out and have them make sense, the detail differences between this and the A1. Okay, I've uh, just got this one off the shelf. Uh, I've not done a review on this, I did the Brighton one, but I thought I'd show you I also managed to track down Leadenhall as well. And I suppose it's indicative of the fact that I've really fallen in love with these locomotives. They have such charm to them. I'm going to lay this next to the Brighton Works Terrier and instantly some of the things that jump out to you is that um, those sort of greedy boards on the bunker extension. It does look a little bit plasticky in this colour, um, but it is something that it is nice that they've got that detailed difference for the bunker, which um, I'm guessing a lot of the locomotives had later in life. Both of these come fitted with the Westinghouse pump. Um, it is interesting, I must go and check at some point. Uh, I think that the locomotives that had that removed later in life have been accurately modelled without it. Um, but um, these both have the Westinghouse pump. You can see as well that the, the actual livery colour is um, exactly the same, but uh, I love the way that they've got the, the style of the lettering from the London and Brighton South Coast Railway, but it's the Brighton Works instead, and then we've got the BR number on the, the back there rather than the original uh, LBSC number, which, you know, obviously makes sense. Um, other detail differences, I'm just looking to the back. Um, 
not really any other differences. We've got the protective bars on the windows to uh, protect them from coal from breaking the glass, which uh, Leadenhall doesn't have. So that is a detail difference along with that extended bunker top. Uh, just turning it around, we've got some extra fittings as well on the top of the boiler. So you can just see them there. Extra pipe work, which is not replicated on the earlier liveried terrier. We've also got these breathers on the water tanks. They're just correctly plated over at the front here, uh, which is another really nice touch. Um, is the whistle the same? The whistle does appear to be the same. The front of the cabs, actually it's interesting. I hadn't noticed this before, but Leadenhall there has all the holes in the cab front for the pipework for the A1X. Um, and I'm guessing that Brighton would have had the same there as well. Um, that's actually interesting. I never noticed that before, but now when you do the comparison, it's like it looks like somebody's been taking pot shots with a rifle at it. <laughs> it's got bullet holes in. Um, but um, I suppose it's one of the compromises that they've had to make. Uh, it's certainly something that I've not seen people actually pick up on online. They get fascinated by other minor, minor things and completely missed that. Um, what is interesting as well is, um, I'm just looking there, there does appear to be an extra hole going on there with nothing in it. That's very strange. Um, but we've got these extra pipes running the length of the boiler. Um, we've also got this kind of uh, uh, tuning fork shaped brackets. I think that they would have been for things like fire irons, for raking the fire perhaps, something like that. I'm not entirely sure. Um, it's actually the closer you look, the more detailed differences you can find. We've got the condensation apparatus. This was because they'd worked through a lot of the tunnels in the kind of London overground, underground area. So they had condensing apparatus to stop them from filling the tunnels with uh, smoke and steam. And that would actually take the exhaust out outflow from the uh, actual uh, cylinders and feed it back in through the water tanks to kind of condense some of that back out. And uh, what's interesting is that uh, the actual tank sides don't have the holes where they would go, but the actual front of the uh, cab on that does. Very, very strange. What else have we got? Well, the other big area, of course, you can see there is look at the front splashes. Uh, the A1 has that um, very flared front, and we've just lost, which one has just lost the step? Um, that has come off Leadenhall. That's uh, one of the things you have to be a little bit careful with. It is a push interference fit with a little dab of glue, and uh, I'm going to have to repair that. <laughs> So I've just popped that step back in. Um, but those front splashes, uh, you can see there on the A1X, we've got a slightly longer smoke box, which is actually very accurately replicated on this Hornby model. So that they are quite different um, at the fronts there. And um, it's difficult to tell is the chimney cap different as well. It looks slightly different. Um, there's slightly more gold on Leadenhall than there is on the Brighton Works, but I don't know whether that's just a difference in painting or I think it's a totally, yes, it's a different profiled chimney cap there. So there are a lot of subtle detail differences. We've also got these uh, lamp irons as well going on on here. So really it's, to all intents and purposes, a different locomotive. And I'm really pleased to see that Hornby have tooled up for these. Now, I mentioned the older models, and it's always fun to uh, give a comparison between the old Terrier and the new one. As you can see, the London Brighton and South Coast Railway ochre is more of a brown on these, and there are so many deficiencies that it's actually a cruel comparison. It was a good loco in its day. What's even worse, I'll tell you this now, is that the very last um, terrier that was released is even worse. It looks quite faded out there. It's, it's not a pretty locomotive, and that was... Um, I think that was the last London Brighton South Coast Terrier to ever be released from the old moulding. They run okay, 
but really as you can see that it just is no comparison um, and also they're kind of a hybrid between the two in fact I'm looking there they've got the smoke box of the A1X the splashes of the A1 um, some very chunky plastic going on there um, yeah they're not really a much of anything but um, overall I think that there's a really credible model um, if anything I'm I'm finding that I'm more drawn to the A1X than I was to the A1. And um, it just feels to me even more refined. It's slavishly um, copied the prototype really well. And it's nice to see that they haven't done a compromise between the two. So um, some of the detail differences I do prefer on the A1X um, over the A1. Uh, and actually the A1, it's those, those sort of, I'm going to call them the bullet holes in that cab front. <laughs> Once you see them, it's like, oh, um, so a little detraction. In terms of running characteristics on DC, this model performs really, really well. And on DCC as well, it has the weight to keep on going. It uh, might benefit from a stay alive, but there really isn't any room in there to fit it. When it comes to DCC fitting, uh, I've already DCC fitted several of these locomotives. So we're going to show you the footage from when I DCC fitted the Brighton Terrier rather than the Brighton Works because it's exactly the same process. And uh, we're going to cut away to that now. First things first, flat head screwdriver underneath the front coupling and very carefully lever that out so you don't damage that tail. Put that to one side and that exposes the screw underneath the buffer beam. The next one that we want is the small crosshead screwdriver and we're going to undo the front one and we're going to just carefully put that to one side so we don't lose it. And then this screw here which is visible straight off the bat just in front of the coupling and again and I warn you now, these two screws aren't quite the same length, so um, very difficult to show. You may just be able to see there that the one that came out of the back just there is slightly longer. Don't get them mixed up because you will get them, um, you'll get problems putting this back together afterwards with one screw protruding and uh, not being able to tighten properly at the front and one which doesn't really grip at the back. The entire chassis then just wiggles free and slides out. And there we go. Looking to the inside of the body, it's, there's a lot of cast metal parts in here and it really is quite nice how it's been put together. There isn't any space in the tank sides to get creative with things like really tiny speakers or stay alive, or indeed even to house the DCC decoder. So I'm warning you now, this is not a locomotive that really rewards the kind of person who wants to go sound fitted. And then what we see on the front here is the micro trainomatic six pin decoder. Don't get the normal one because it is a bigger form factor and believe me, you will never fit it in here. I'm going to pull this out. The little piece of tape is just to keep things neat. And what you will notice once all this is out is your six pin decoder is in a little clip there and uh, the actual plug just plugs into it. Your orange wire is pin one and that is this side. So it does plug in neatly. And by having this small plug with the wiring loom, it doesn't protrude beyond the front here. Believe me, there is no room inside the body beyond that point. There's also no room above here for any of the wire or a decoder. This fits very snugly up inside the body. I've also investigated and there is no real space at the back here either. So you can't even get a decoder into that space. It really is a tight fit. And you have to be very careful. The micro decoder from Trainomatic uh, does come with quite a long wiring loom. What I would say is had I had available 
the one with the bare wiring loom that you solder on yourself, I would have probably gone for a hard wire of this locomotive. We need to make really good use of the space. So loop the wire round underneath the DCC plug, round again, loop it under again. The idea behind this is we want to put this wire in every available space that we can put it in to avoid it from causing an issue with the actual fitting. The chip then sits neatly on top and I've used just a little bit of tape to hold that wire from trying to go over the side of the boiler barrel. It's very important at this stage, don't cover the decoder with tape because you will cause it to overheat. Make sure that any little bits of wire that are trying to make a break for freedom are carefully tucked in. And then that decoder will just fit, and I mean just fit. Very carefully now, we feed it in, and you want to try and get those sanding pipes to go over the brake rigging at the front there, and then just very gently find its place. At this stage, you want to just check down there, and you can see that wiring is making a bid to stick out through that gap. So just very carefully feed that all in. Don't scratch the paint. The other side looks good. And one of the other things as well, what you may find useful here is a set of tweezers. And there is a pipe, one on either side. It's quite springy, but it has this nasty habit of getting tucked in and that's probably what's pulling those wires out. That's so much better, there we are. And a little pair of tweezers such as these, you can just tweak it out. The other side hasn't jammed, so we're good. Looking to the underneath, we need to make sure that these sanding pipes are in the right place. So there and there. They are very springy, you can manipulate them, but that's when the paint just flakes off. Again to the back, we need to grab hold of them, tweak them, and you can see the paint just flaking off. It is a little bit of an issue. Once that's in the right place, find the screw holes and then just slowly, slowly try and get it in position. If it doesn't go into position first time, I'm afraid, it's because the chip has moved. And this is what I mean about it being very unforgiving. Let's get these screws in just to hold it. Slight magnetism on the screwdriver is very helpful for this. Don't over tighten them, you'll strip the thread and then you really will have a problem with this locomotive simply because the springiness in those wires will forever push the body off. And there we have it, coupling back in. Oh, and we also want to just tweak these. So again, so I always said these, the fact that they're springy is great. Those are in place. If you don't do this, they, they will get caught up in your motion and will cause very poor running. So you have to be very careful. And they do tend to just spring into the right place. But as you see, that red paint is not the best with the springiness. I'd rather have them springy and black than red and not springy because they will snap. And that's how you DCC fit this model. Running characteristics of this locomotive are still very, very good. It romped around the layout with a short prototypical train really, really well. Tackled gradients with no problems whatsoever. And for me, I just felt that it was, it did everything that it needed to do and it did that well. 
In terms of DCC fitting, it is a bit of a toughie, but it can be done as we've shown in this video. And uh, there aren't any other little gimmicks like uh, firebox flicker or anything like that. What you see is what you get. And if you want to go down the sound route, really, it's not for the faint-hearted. I wouldn't attempt a sound fitting on this. I'm told that there are specialist sound chips and speakers which can be made to fit in here, but that really is a tight fit. So... <laughs> I don't feel that this is a natively supporting sound locomotive, but sound isn't the be all and end all. So we turn now to scores and uh, on the scores, it's going to be fairly similar to the Brighton Terrier that we uh, reviewed some weeks ago. But first up, we've got finish and really there is nothing to fault with this. One of the things that I've been seeing online is people complaining about a translucency of the spokes. And I'll be honest, my view about this is a fault that you have to really go looking for. And I struggled to see what they were talking about. It really isn't a fault at all. So it still doesn't bother me uh, in this livery. There's nothing wrong for me with the colour of those spokes. So finish, it still gets a good 9.5 out of 10. Functionality, again, it did everything that it needed to. And for me, it's another faultless performer from Hornby. There's not a lot to be said, so it matches the Brighton Terrier at 9.8 out of 10. Ease of use. Again, the DCC fitting is quite tough on these, but what I do find is that the more that I do, the easier it gets. So I'm guessing that my previous score might have been a bit stingy, so I'm going to give it a 6.2 out of 10. On the aesthetics, this is really, for me, where this locomotive has upped the game. There's something about the A1X that, for me, really works well. That extra detail on the top of the water tanks really does look good, and that attention to detail with the bigger smoke box and the change in that front uh, flange and splashes really works out well. I actually prefer this A1X to the A1. It just really looks right. The only thing that I think is a bit of a detraction is this: uh, these greedy rails on the coal bunker do look a little bit plasticky. But on the other hand, they are replicated true to the prototype. So for me, I think that I'm going to give this a 9 out of 10 for aesthetics. Value for money is an area where, for me, Hornby do really well with models for their collector's club. This model is actually offered at a reduction in price over what the main range locomotives and terriers are being sold for at their full RRP. And actually it works out that a terrier plus membership of the club comes to about what you would have paid direct from Hornby for any of the other terriers. So it does offer a great value for money in that respect. You can join the club and actually if you join the club just for this locomotive, you won't be out of pocket and you'll still get some of the other benefits of the club. So I thought that that was a really nice touch. So I'm going to give this 10 out of 10 on value for money. And that gives us an overall score of 44.4 .4 out of 50. And that's a rise of 0.3 over the Brighton Terrier. And I think actually it really does deserve those extra marks. These Terrier locomotives are really so cute. I found myself becoming a little bit obsessed about finding them all in this LBSC livery. They are so nice and I can certainly tell you with absolute authority that this won't be the last Terrier that I add to my collection. Well, I hope you found that video really informative and don't forget to tickle that like button and sharing is caring. So don't forget to put us out there on social media, sharing the video on the platform of your choice. And uh, if you haven't already done so, don't forget as well, subscribe to the channel, ring that bell and you'll be the first to know about new videos as and when they go up. But until next time, a big, big thank you to all of you for watching. It's always great to hang out with you. Don't forget as well, the Monday Club, and you can find us and check us out over on Patreon. But until next time, take great care of yourself. Bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you.
I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Michael Churchwood, Anthony Hunt, William Wade, Wayne Johns, Offshore Allen, oorail.co.uk, Tepic, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Peter Bolton, Brian Smith, Brian and Dorothy Mudd, Gary Lewis, David Quinn, Trish Bits, Sparky 10707, George Botterini, Andy Finch, Chris Moss, Robert Sears, MD of San Juan Model Company and Grant Line Products, and Judge Mortis. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.